Um, welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Aretes Parent Engagement Network entitled A Community-Led Approach to Empowering Families to Be Their Child's First Educators. My name is Zoe Gill and I'm a project manager working on the parent engagement team. This webinar is reaching across the more than 500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations that make up contemporary Australia. We therefore would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all those countries and pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. Wherever you are in Australia today, you may wish to make your own acknowledgement of country to the traditional owners and elders of the land on which you are currently standing. I'd also like to welcome today's participants from New Zealand. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Today, we'll be hearing from Dominique Smith. Dominique has worked in the community sector for 13 years with a focus on families, trauma, and the impact of substance misuse on the family structure. Her passion for a grassroots approach and the importance of building the capacity of individuals to be the leaders in their own change is what has allowed Dominique to have continued enthusiasm for her chosen career. Having worked at Marlin, Marlin Wan Sakura running the Bayagui Child and Parent, Parent Centre in Fitzroy Crossing, WA, Dominique has experience working with local Indigenous community members to help empower them to create a healthy life for their children in the community. Over to you, Dominique. Hello, how are you going? Um, thank you all for coming to listen to me today. Um, this is the first time I've ever done anything with technology, so um, excuse me if I muck it up or I'm not looking properly. Um, this is all very new to me. Um, so yeah, as Zoya said, my name is Dominique and um, I have the amazing life here in Fitzroy Crossing, which is a remote town in, um, in WA. So I'm actually sitting at the Child and Parents Centre now. I don't work there anymore. I left and have moved to work in the youth space about four months ago, but I still come and visit here almost daily and have a really good relationship with um, the centre still and family. So they've let me use the space to run the webinar today. Um, so basically just some context around Fitzroy Crossing. It's um, 400 k's inland from Broome. It's um, kind of stretches about 300 k's the valley. And in Fitzroy as a town, we have a population of about 900 to 1,000 people. But in the Greater Valley of about 300 k's, um, it's about 3,000 people. We've got five different language groups, um, Indigenous language groups that we work with. So sometimes that can make it um, quite complex, uh, as there's always some different politics between um, those groups. And so when we might want to run things, we have to be really conscious of that. Uh, as I mentioned, I started my time working here at Mana Montakura at the Child and Parent Centre as a manager here. So there's 21 Child and Parent Centres across WA. Um, and yeah, I moved up here to run this one here. And uh, I came, I guess, with my experience of working in, with families and in the child and family sector, mainly around alcohol, tobacco and other drug use and how that has an impact um, largely on families and children's ability to learn when that kind of trauma and that stuff is happening at home. So coming to Fitzroy Crossing where that is um, quite evident, I felt that I, you know, was coming with some skills and knowledge and able to transfer that here. But, you know, nothing could prepare me for this place. It's quite unique and I've learned a lot in my time here. And even since uh, presenting at the conference last year, I know this, my presentation has changed a bit today because, you know, you're just constantly learning um, from the families, from other colleagues and um, myself. So yeah, um, one of the major things here, I guess, is that you know I can come with my ideas around my methodology for working with families and that grassroots approach. Um, and you know you want to transfer that knowledge to, to staff. But the biggest hurdle I found here was actually having access to qualified um, or experienced staff. So. Uh, really having to take that step back and look at well how you know are we even more so going to build up the community and the community's capacity to um, to run things and to be confident and confident in their ability to support um, their neighbours themselves and their family um, and so often in this the role that I had here it was about bringing in external um, service providers from interstate. We worked a lot with a company place called Rural Far West. Um, you know, so because we just didn't have access to people here, even when it comes to allied health, it'd be like once every eight weeks that we would be getting access to 
physio, speeches and things like that. So when we look at the context of how we actually support families, it's actually quite hard here. Um, one thing, you know, in anywhere, but definitely here is, you know, that time and patience that when we ask that question, you know, what do we want, what do we need, or how do we build up people's capacity, it was, um, it's a lot about having that time and that patience. And I definitely understand that that's really hard, you know, when we've got funders, we've got time restraints and that pressure of the day-to-day -day stress of the job. But I think um, what you might get out of this presentation is that I'll often mention the time. Time is important that we need to set that time aside to, to learn about our community, to learn about our families, to learn about what they need and want. And then with that time, um, we can then actually impact a lot of change. Um, you know, I might mention a cup of tea often. I don't really actually drink tea that often because it's so hot up here, but it's that, having that glass of water, having that cup of tea, having that yarn and, and sitting. And so um, with that, I found that, I guess, you know, the response rate, um, and I'll give an example because it's always easy, is that, you know, if I compared myself to a, a metro area in WA and their child and parent centre and um, how they were working with families and their numbers that they were getting were amazing. I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what am I doing wrong? But then I looked at, you know, the context of here and we've got a population of 900 people in this small town, so our numbers are going to be really different. And then you look at how much time you want to spend with people and then the outcomes that I was actually seeing were really different and I, you know, I won't go as far as saying far greater because everyone's outcomes are really important but you know you, you could tell really um, amazing case studies and stories and so sometimes we you know we want to achieve this and sometimes we might just achieve this but what we've achieved in this small um, three or four families could be better than what we've achieved with 50 families because we're working really intensely, we're taking that time and we're really looking at what they want and what they need, what their children's learning um, needs are, what the family's learning needs are. And that's one thing that's been big from this experience and living here in the Kimberley is actually um, before we can even start to look at the child's learning needs, um, we had to look at the parents because sometimes the parents hadn't had, um, you know, full schooling or you know, schooling at all and, you know, their literacy levels and their um, confidence was really low. So actually really working with them and building them up before we could even look at the child. But at the same time, while we're working with them, of course, the impact was happening to the child. Um, so if anyone who doesn't understand what the Child and Parent Centre is, it's based on the hub and spoke model. So I was really excited to come and work here back in Tasmania where I'm from. Uh, we had the same set up with um, Child and Family Centres. So it's basically a one-stop shop for families. So it was really important to make sure that we were running as many services and allowing families to access allied health and their early learning um, experiences for the children all the one-stop. Um, so that they weren't going from here to here to here. You know, it's hot here, people don't have cars and things like that, so it's like, right, we'll, we'll bring in here and you can have all your needs met. Um, we, um, you know, obviously in this town there's the Indigenous population, but there is a lot of non-Indigenous people here that come and they provide um, the service provision more, most likely. So what is really important is that cross-cultural, two-way um, delivery, so often, um, when we're delivering anything, we really make sure that we have a, an Indigenous person there to make sure that we're being culturally sensitive and appropriate, along with our non-Indigenous workers. So, um, yeah, that was like a really important aspect of working here. And in my new role, it's the same. Um, I'm working with youth in the youth space, doing some case management and other activities. And it's really important to have a, a local um, Indigenous person working alongside me to make sure that, um, you know, if we're going out on country, all that type of stuff is appropriate and respecting their land and um, the language. Um, as I said just before, I've moved into the youth sector and that's really exciting because when I was doing some parenting workshops um, in the last year or two, one thing that came really, really apparent to me is, you know, we're working with these parents and these families, but often um, the young people, like the youth of the family, and when I say young, as young as 10, are doing the parenting role. 
and, you know, doing it really well. And so that's when we started to realise, actually, you know, we really need to work with these young people and building, you know, not putting extra pressure on them, but building their capacity, looking at their skills, you know, because they're the ones that are often reading to the children because mum and dad might not be able to read, but they've been learning at school. So they're the ones that are helping with the colours and doing all that incidental learning as well. So um, it's been exciting, you know, moving into the, the youth space and really um, celebrating with them about the, you know, the important role that they're playing in their younger siblings' life. Um, you know, they are just they're just so nurturing and at the moment I am I've got two kids in my care, um, local kids from here, and I know that um some of the older cousins, sisters and things like that that are around town and watching them and watching actually how the boys that I've got the three and four respond to what they say and the learning that they're giving when we're at the playground and we're talking about the trees and the colours, to me is far greater, you know, they speak their own um, language, they've got their own language of Creole, so it's really important to keep that alive and, you know, myself, I'm dark in colour but I'm not an Indigenous um, person, so I've moved here and what the kids call me um, Black Gadia, so Gadia is what the name they use for white people, but I'm Black Gadia and so they say to me, um, you know, they find it amazing that I can't speak their language and their words. And I think that one of the big things I've learned, and in particular since leaving um, the conference last year, and I wish I spoke more about it, is the importance of when we're teaching and we're looking at that grassroots level empowering that we actually don't take away that language, that we, we, um, we can teach the standard English and we can encourage that. Um, so if children want to head off and go to university and do different things, but their language and their culture is so, so important. And um, here where they speak um, Creole as their first language, which is a dialect of English, it's really important to keep that alive and in alive in their learning. And so that's why making sure that we have local Indigenous staff always working alongside us so that we don't lose that is really, really important to help them develop their full potential. And I always say to the kids and to the families, you're so lucky, you're so clever, you know. Some of you might speak three languages. I've only got one, you know, language, so. Um, anyway, I'll get more into the how, you know, I work at a, you know, a grassroots level to empower families. And I don't think it's, um, you know, um, rocket science. I don't think it's anything different than a lot of you that have dialed in might already be doing, but um, yeah, I'll talk about what I do. So as I said before, time, time to stop and, and talk. So I'm probably quite terrible with my email sometimes and you know, I'll fall behind on my data and all that type of stuff because I just really, really think that we need to, you know, um, a family needs us or a child needs us. So, you know, we've got to work for the people we're working for. What's the point of filling in an amazing report or having the best stats and all that is the work we're doing and the people we're doing the work for is important. But, you know, we can find ourselves so busy at this meeting and this meeting and this teleconference and I've got this email to do. Um, so um, with that, sorry, I just had somebody walk in. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm in this webinar. I'm really sorry, but I'm not really Okay, sorry, I've just had a slight emergency come up with the two boys that I'm caring for, and that's the joy of this town. Um, hopefully that will be dealt with. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so what was I saying? So what's the point of, you know, meeting our KPIs if there's not you know, that meaning behind it. And like, this is me talking on my own personal experience working in this sector, so I'm not saying throw out our rules and our KPIs and things like that. They are important, our meetings are important. But what I've learned, and most recently in the last couple of years living here, is that if we just take that step back and take that breath, and you know, I have a lot to do with our funders often, um, and it's quite amazing how they actually really do enjoy those stories. They actually do enjoy, you know, going away from the black and white paper and actually, you know, letting them know, like, 
oh, this is what we're doing and having, you know, that conversation with them, sending an email. Um, here it's a little bit different. Sometimes our funders are actually right here and so they'll actually come to some of our meetings and, you know, it just adds that person to the bits of paper. So that's one of my suggestions. Um, living in a small town, um, for me to be able to do my work, I think it's really important to be part of the community. So. Um, I don't shy away from the IGA when it's busy and there's going to be families there. I go there and I, I recognise how hard it is to walk around the um, walk around the shop with uh, a child and you know talk to them and you know I don't judge them because their kids are screaming and yelling in the trolley wanting a lolly and you know we because you know two weeks ago I've seen that family and we've talked about goal setting. Um, in the parenting workshop, so like actually then saying, oh, this is really hard, isn't it? Like we've talked about that goal setting, but the reality is we're here in the supermarket seems to put those lollies right at the level where a kid can reach and actually, you know, um, trying to implement some of the strategies we've learned right there in person while it's happening. Um, the sporting club, you know, football is a really big thing here, so I injected myself into the sporting um, club and um, made sure that, you know, my face was out there, my name was out there and people, you know, start to feel more comfortable. And I know that in different areas throughout Australia, you know, that can be a lot harder. You know, some of you might be dialing in from big cities and stuff like that. And so I'm obviously giving an example for the context in which I live in. But, you know, that has really, really helped with that. Um, building that relationship and rapport is being there, being present, being at the, at the park, going up to the school now that I'm working in the youth sector and being there on fruit break and just kicking the ball around, talking to the kids, going on the lunch time, just sitting at assemblies, even though I've got nothing to do with assembly, but, you know, clapping, being excited. So when I see the kids say, hey, you got a merit certificate yesterday for, um, you know, being a good team player or your artwork so that you're building that connection. And, you know, and like I said, it does take time and you do have to plan for it. But I honestly feel like the outcomes are just so much greater for it. Um, you know, I'm living in a town where flyers and websites, um, they're kind of a bit superfluous here. People, it's a very oral community, so it's about someone might come up to me and say, hey, you know, what's on this week? And I'm thinking, oh my God, I spent all this time on this big flyer and it's so bright and colourful, but, you know, that can be standing right next to me, that flyer, but they want to know from you, they want to talk to you, they want to hear it from you. So, um, you know... Sometimes we get carried away with all of our merchandise and our fancy websites, but just talking to people um, can make all the difference. Um, and so, you know, like I was mentioning before, the, the follow-on from that is that, uh, you know, you build trust and you build relationships and rapport, so then when it comes down to actually saying to someone, you know, and for me, I know in this sector I found it really hard because I'm young, I don't have children, you know, people probably think, what's this girl going on about talking about bedtime routine or boundaries and things like that with kids when she doesn't have them herself. But, you know, once you've built that relationship and that trust, people will start to come to you and trust you because, you know, I have researched a lot of it and I have practiced a lot of it and I've worked with families, so I have that to go for and um, they will actually believe me and then they'll actually, you know, what I find more rewarding than anything is when someone comes to you. You know, we can preach and we can sit there and we can say all the things and run all the workshops, but the greatest experience and the greatest learning comes when someone is doing that self-help and they're feeling empowered and they're feeling confident to be able to ask for help and ask questions about their child's learning on their own. Um, yeah, so, you know, I can't emphasise enough how much time, relationship building, building that rapport and that trust is so important and um, yeah, with that the learning comes. Um, here uh, in the Kimberley, a lot of families have experienced trauma. When we talk about the stolen generation, we I'm looking these people right in the face right here and you know that was a really big learning curve for me. Um, you know that was it wasn't a lifetime ago, it is this lifetime for people. So when you're sitting and you're yarning with the grandparents of the children um, that we're working with, um, they were the stolen generation. So their children, who are the parents, the little ones, they have the impact of that. 
And so then our little kids are having the impact of that too, you know, that intergenerational trauma. So creating that space, calm space, is really, really important because often we're, we're facing um, families that are living in overcrowded houses of 10, 13 or more people and we're talking two and three bedroom houses. So people living on top of each other, noise is, is a big thing, alcohol in the home, um, you know, some petty crime. Like generally like when we talk about crime rates up here, you know, there's break-ins. So a lot of time people are breaking in because they're hungry. They're breaking in for food. Um, but when that's all happening, it's really important that when we have a um, when we have a venue like this, that we are creating a soft, calm space. And that was a change for me because I was working in the kids. You know, we had music going, we're loud and we're happy and we're, you know, engaging in that manner. And then that was too full on for people, so I've had to really change things around and look at you know those really softer settings and. Um, you know, when you go on MTA, for example, Modern Teaching Aid, the, um, the catalogue of all these beautiful things um, for children to play on, they're actually quite bright and colourful. And so I started not using that for, um, and really looking more to that, the natural um, colours and toning things down and having less things as well because people were so overwhelmed and then introducing things slowly. Um, so that soft, calm space, we use outdoor space a lot. Um, we have the luxury of all year round having really, really nice weather. Um, some people might not consider 40 degrees plus nice weather, but I do like it. So using, um, you know, the river and using the oval and um, just allowing that earth kind of feeling to come through for people to run barefoot, like the learning in that. and. Um, and harnessing on that with the children about what that feels like and, and the noises and just the nature and stuff. So that's really important here. Um, you know, having the door open as well, like I know that we also need to have open and closed times, but I'm really into the open door policy that, and I was told one time, you know, oh, it seems like the the families are managing you, Dominique, and you're not managing them. And I was really disheartened by that comment because I think if a family has um, driven in, you know, 20Ks and got, if they haven't got a car, they've found someone who's got a car and they've come in to the service that I provide to, to see me and I'm meant to be writing a report. Yeah, the report's important, but that family is going to come first. And so I think that, um, you know, we're going to have a play group from 9 to 11, but if the family still wants to stay to 12 because, you know, going back home is not the best place for them, like, let's let them stay to 12. And if someone turns up at 8 o'clock before the thing starts, then that's okay. Let's cut them up some fruit and let them and their child play. So just really that open door policy, and the same applies at the moment while I'm working in the youth um, space is that I'm, you know, that door is open. We're at the moment, we're painting up a spare office that's not being used because the kids just love coming in because they've got cold water and air con and um, someone that asked them about their days. So we're kind of creating a space that we can let them get on the iPad or use the PlayStation or just chill out um, before walking home or getting a ride from me. Um, so with that, you know, safe space, I suppose, you know, then we're really obviously always mindful that we're role modeling those supported learning behaviours and um, that everyone that we come into contact with, volunteers, staff, the other young people, making them accountable. And so I think that what I've learned in the last couple of years living here too is like I came up here with an idea on what learning should be and the developmental milestones of children and how the parents of the child first educated and that is still so, so, so true but even more so I've really learned that that looks so, so different to everyone, every different community and we need to be so flexible and adaptable to that and that we need to really look at people's interest areas and acknowledge um, that the cultural and traditional um, learning um, here are really important and we need to grab onto that and that the kids are, you know, learning through that just as much as um, if they can pick every colour and count and do their ABC.
Um, so I mentioned before the parenting program, so that's like um, Triple P, Positive Parenting, some of you might know of. Um, here in the Kimberley, they um, developed their, a different kind of version of it um, called Johnny Under You, um, which is about, um, basically there was a prevalence study done um, a few years back um, into the FASD rate, so uh, it came back one in three children here. Um, are affected by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and if you don't know what that is, it's basically um, where the child is affected by um, the mother's alcohol use by in utero and so that then in turn leaves the child with some learning difficulties, um, in severe cases might have some facial defects from it, the behaviour and learning and so we are dealing and you know one of three and in affected by um, that and that's just from the studies that could even be more that didn't participate so we're really mindful of that here and so the parenting um, journey under you the triple P that, that is carried out throughout the valley is really important and that again is done in a culturally sensitive way so we've got the um, local Indigenous person with a non-Indigenous person delivering that and we um, we deliver it in small groups uh, so we can allow for those questions and a more intimate group and it's, um, it's not to come and do a workshop on a Friday afternoon or you know two day workshop it, it actually goes for quite some time and we break it down a lot smaller and then we work with the families ongoing after it's not like okay you've got your certificate and off you go you're going to be a great parent now positive parenting is your thing it's like actually checking in with them two weeks later a month later ongoing all the time um, and of course that's easier because we're in a small town um, because we know that there's going to be a roller coaster of emotions you know one family I worked with um, two years ago, she's had another baby and so, you know, her old kids and we were working, um, you know, with a nine and an eight year old, now things are really, really different for her. So it's not that she need, might need to do the whole parenting course again, it's about engaging with her and knowing that we're here for her and that, um, you know, any tips, any um, support we can give can, you know, um, be given to her and it's not just two years ago when you did the course. Um, here transport's really, really um, a big thing too for us to do what we do and to work with families because how are we going to empower families to, to seek help and to help themselves if they can't even get to what we're doing? So I can spend a minimum an hour to two hours doing pickups in the morning or in the afternoon for our events, for our programs, and then the same, taking people home. And people might say, oh, you're spoon feeding, or you're, um, you know, you're enabling them, you know, they need to, you know, they've got two legs and a heart, they need to get there and do it themselves. But I just think, why make it harder? Like, we are funded, we are paid to deliver these services. Let's do what we can to get people here and to support people. So going around and bibbing the horn and turning up at people's houses or where you might know the local hangout spots, you know, here there's um, a bit of an issue with um, a card game, for example, where people um, are gambling their own money sitting around a tree in an in a, um, open space. Now I am notorious for rocking out there and um, not gambling myself, but just sitting there and saying, Come on, you know, let's come. Yeah, let's come to the morning tea or come to the play group. And in the end, people do jump on the bus. So I think they're just sick of me going there. But you know, we don't. I don't want to shy away from those areas. I don't want to judge those people. You know, people might think, oh, these kids. You know, these people are gambling their kids' money away, and they're terrible, and they should be have their kids taken off them. But you know what? They've got a lot of issues going on. They've got so much and the reasons behind it. So if I can just get one or two families away from that scene and show them something better, show them a different experience, then yeah, maybe they won't be there next week and maybe they won't be gambling their kid money away and they'll be buying nappies and food for the kids. But the non-judgmental, non-critical um, lens is really, really important um, for our families because you know, as I said before, we're dealing with families here who have been oppressed for so many years and um, that intergenerational trauma is so um, real here. And just recently I had my cousin come up and, and visit and I'm adopted, so she's white. And, um, you know, she was saying how she almost felt uncomfortable because she was embarrassed, you know, for 
you know, white Australian, what's happened here? And I said, well, I actually think the people here are quite marvellous because I don't find that people um, look at white people like you did this or you did that. They're really open to us being here and teaching and helping them learn and helping them um, reach their full potential with their children. It's just about how we go about doing it. And they are going to be full shy. They are going to have shame about some of their behaviours that we've just got to, you know, kind of close off and book past it. And not hold grudges, you know. If someone signed up for a parenting course and then they didn't turn up and that was somebody else's spot, yeah, you know, you feel a bit pissed off. You're like, oh, no, that other family could have that spot. But then, you know, if they sign up next time and they hadn't turned up the time before, like, just let them in. Just go, okay, wow, you really made the effort to come again. Like, I think that sometimes we get really um, caught up in things like that. But And even with the young kids, you know, basketballs go missing all the time or kids will rock the van or kids will graffiti. Like, kids will be kids and we, we hold them accountable to their actions and we make them apologise and we talk to them about respectful behaviours. But it's really important not to hold grudges, to still say, hey, how are you going? And to move forward and make them feel comfortable. Um, provision of food is always good no matter where I've worked. People love food, they'll come for food. And I've found that even more so here. And here, you know, it's been really important to um, expose mob to some of the different food, um, food that they're not used to eating. Um, so that's been really good and using that as a learning experience. Um, and, you know, this one might sound a little bit weird, but touch people. You know, um, there's so many rules now you hear about back home in Tassie, you know, where, um, you know, you can't have a kid sit on your lap or parents, you know, can't take a photo or something at a swimming carnival, all these rules. And I'm, I know we've got to follow policies and procedures to a point, but I tell you what, just love. Love is so important. Like giving someone a pat on the back or just pulling them in and giving them that little squeeze, you literally see and feel the melt. You feel the, the, the walls go down and you're giving them the warm fuzzies. Like, we need to get back to that is what I think. And I'm not just talking about our little kids. I'm talking about our adults, you know. But we're out here, one in two women are experiencing domestic violence. So there's not much love going on sometimes in the home. So when they come in and they might look tired and they might look bruised and battered, like I would give them a big hug. I give them a kiss on the forehead because they need it, you know. They're not getting it. And, again, that's building that relationship and breaking down those barriers. And same with the kids. I got head life this year for the first time in my whole life and I swear it's because the kids just climb all over me and you know that touch is just happening and um, I'm yet to be told it's inappropriate. I didn't like having head lights but that's what happens and I'll I'll get it again because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stop letting that contact um, that human contact happen because I think it's really really important and then from that you know we can actually then go into those conversations about boundaries and when touch is appropriate and not appropriate and so when we start looking at some of those um, inappropriate sexualized behaviors or you know child sexual abuse and stuff like that if we're working in that area it's a little bit easier because we're looking at you know we're giving examples then of what is good and what's not so if I'm standing there you know like a cold robot um, you know it's really hard to portray those messages to someone um, I don't know how I'm going for time but I think basically nearly out of time so I'll just um, just wrap it up basically and, you know I'm just constantly asking questions asking people what they want you know um, whether and, and they'll tell me like I had one last year say we want a family portrait day because where we live we don't have the you know, we can't go to Meyer and get our lovely photos taken. So we set up an area, we took photos, and I went into Broome, and we have them printed at Harvey Norman and, um, you know, quite large, and, you know, we donated them to the family. Um, and that was really lovely. And sometimes I'll ask for something, and I can't deliver, but I'll damn try, or I'll just... And, and often it's good to tell them why not. So um, we went through a consultation about a new playground here because the playground's quite old and dated, and you find it quite amazing, the materials that are used here when we're looking at 45-degree heat days. And um, a lot of the kids, well, they can't slide on the slide because it's hot, it's going to burn your bum. So the parents were asking about a new playground and, and there's a spot that they wanted it to go. 
So we went to council and we talked and we talked to everyone. At the end of the day, it couldn't go there because of safety reasons, because of power poles and all that. So that's okay, we couldn't deliver what families wanted, but we went back and we told them. We didn't just not deliver, we tell people, okay, why? And so then they feel, so then we go, well, you know, what's plan A, what, um, B, what's plan C? Involving them in all those decisions and just owning up when we can't do things. And often, you know, um, for, I know a lot of people, the number one reason is money, you know? And again, just saying to them, like, that's actually going to cost $280,000 to do this, you know, or a skate park is actually going to cost $100,000 because we need to remove this building of asbestos and we need to do this, this and that. But I don't often understand all those background things, but people just, you know, say we're going to do something, they don't do it, and that's how they feel disempowered. They're like, you know, why did you say this and you're not doing it? So we've got to communicate, communicate, communicate. And I guess, you know, at the end of the day, um, for me, a community-led approach is that I am the person that's getting paid. You know, these people, they come and they are volunteering their time to be with us. So it's almost like sometimes people think it's, you know, it's a privilege that these people need to go, oh, wow, it's so great that we've got, you know, these things here. And it is great, but also we're getting paid to come and do that. So we need to acknowledge that. We need to go um, to nurture people and make them want to come and then we launch into learning. And then on the other side of that is that we are pushed down by our funders and by our KPIs and all those type of things, but we need to get creative. We need to think about how we um, how we report things back. And so if it's said that we've got to do this like A, B, C, D, and I want to throw in an E and an F into this thing, well, maybe I'll do it. Maybe I actually won't tell the funders or whatever because we know that by doing that, it makes a better impact. Or maybe I will and I'll actually um, start to change how we report. And I, and I can actually speak truth to that. So in this role at the Child and Parent Centre, I came in and um, I looked at our reporting template and I was like, whoa, there's so much more things that we're doing and that we're achieving that's not even being documented or captured here. So I said to the funders, hey, do you mind if I add a few boxes? And at first they were like, no, that's the template, Dominic, you just need to do a template. So I just added my own boxes at the end, I didn't listen. And then um, the next um, big meeting that was had, they were like, they'd, they'd read it and they actually found, you know, that, that it was good information. And so then over, it did take 12 months, but over that 12 month process, the government did end up changing that reporting template and to start capturing some of that. You know, so sometimes we just have to push the boundaries. We have to say um, what, you know, what is here isn't good enough. We've got all this and um, our families have these voices that need to be heard and, um, yeah, just be their advocates, be their voices. And that's how I guess I work from that community grassroots level is that I... Um, I literally get on the ground, I get in there, I give a hug, I talk, I spend the time and then I, I capture all that and I feed it back um, to the people that are paying my <laughs> paying my wage at the end of the day. So um, I think that I've probably talked for too long. I will hand it back to Zola and we can have questions, I guess. Well, thank you, Dominique. That was a really, really interesting presentation. I, I caught the recording of your presentation at the PE conference and it's just so wonderful to hear things like that again and in even more depth and yeah, really, really valuable. Thank you. Um, well, we're going to hand it over to questions. If anyone has any questions um, for Dominique, please feel free to um, type them into that question box section and, um, and we can... Uh, we can relay them across. I actually have one question. Um, Dominique, when you were talking about, um, you know, the importance of, of language and, and, and really um, ensuring that language isn't lost and plays a, an important role in learning, um, is there a role that um, language learning plays on the part of the um, educators or service providers in terms of learning um, local languages or of language groups that, um, that people work with? Is there, is there any element of that in um, in what you do? Or the art of work is learning their language. Was that the question? Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so this, that's a really good question because um, so last year I recreated this story book, you know, um, There Was an Old Lady Who Swallowed a Fly. In Creole, so I worked with one of our local ladies and I recreated that into Creole and I went and did it in the schools and then one lady pulled me up and she said, no, you can't do that. And she said, you know, it's really important that, you know, we speak our language and we keep our language and you encourage that. But um, it was all, my, yeah, I was told and I was then told by another local woman that, you know, us as, um, you know, non-Indigenous people um, trying to, it's almost, not disrespectful, they didn't say that word, but I guess it comes back to, so in the school, they've got a red band and a black band, um, often the teachers on their arms. So when a kid comes up um, and says, I need to go Gora, which is they need to go to the tour to do number two. So they've said that to the teacher says, holds up, um, say the black band, which means they're speaking in their language. And then the teacher will hold up her red band and say, you need to go to the toilet. So they will reiterate um, the standard English, but they'll acknowledge that the child has used their, their language. So that's um, what they're saying up here. They're saying that we need to um, empower them to keep using their language, but help them recognise standard English versus their language. But we, um, we shouldn't be using their language. Does that make sense? No, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, we've had a question come through. Um, from Anne, and she's asking if you're able to provide um, maybe an example of um, a family being their child's first educator. I imagine through the Triple P program, there's got you know, quite a few examples around that in engaging with parents. Yeah, so I guess, um, oh gosh, where do I start? So yeah, I'll go just back to the parenting um, workshop. And um, as I was saying, like all of the families, their ability to read and write is, um, is, is a bit, it's a bit harder here. That's just the reality of it. So we had to work with this one mum on, okay, well, how can you, you know, because she was really down on herself. She's like, well, how can I read bedtime stories, you know, to my child when I can't read? And so, you know, just really, and like um, stripping it back to explaining to her how, you know, looking at the pictures and naming all the things in the pictures in the book and that, you know, um, taking your child on country and fishing and how that learning. So I think here, like if I compare to back home where my friends, you know, the baby's not even born yet and they've already um, chosen which rhyme time they're going to go to, which playgroup they're going to like. They're really invested in that sort of learning, whereas here we've had to strip it back and actually explain to families what learning is and how they're actually doing it and how they are their child's first educator and what that word, like breaking that word down, that word educated down. What do you mean, they say, I'm an educator? And I was like, well, you know how when you're making damper, and you're telling the child about the texture of the damper and you're telling the kid how much um, water to put in and flour. You're teaching your child. You are educating your child. You're, you're giving them something to learn. And, you know, these mums are surprised. Like, no, no, I'm just teaching. You know, I'm, they don't even say teaching. Like, they're just, like, we're just showing them, you know. And so then when we're down at the fishing and, um, you know, say you've caught five barramundi, you know, kept counting those um, barramundi up because you can count, you know, um, and getting the children to do that. So putting in it because uh, we don't have flashcards here, you know, our parents don't have the charts on the back of the toilet wall that says A B C D and one two three four on the timetable. But trying to bring into the context of here what it is that they can do and how they can teach their children um, in in their own way and that they, because when we go into their houses, they don't have colouring in books, they don't have the story books and you know what, when I send them home, you know, if I get some donated here and then I send them home with them, they they get torn up and they don't get used properly or they do get used for fire out, you know, when they're making a feed um, because it, there hasn't been that learnt respect because this is a really foreign thing, like even the boys I've got at the moment, because um, I love, love, love books. Um, and now they've got this love for like for reading. But when I first got them, my three and a four year old, I couldn't sit them down to read because they hadn't been exposed to that before. And so now they know. Like last night, your book back. 
So I don't know if that um, is an example of how, yeah, I hope that was all right. Like it's, it's quite raw and it's quite stripped back um, is how we are teaching our families here at the moment how to be their child's educator. Second, I mean, not to use too many buzzwords, but you know that sounds like a very sort of contextual, strength-based approach that that I think could be um, used in a multiplicity of different contexts. Um, so thanks for yeah. that. Um, the question has come through from Maureen that um, is, I guess, I suppose, more uh, structural and policy-focused. Um, perhaps quite a difficult question. Um, it's in relation to um, the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And what do you think will help um, reduce that? And that's thinking in the context of the, um, uh, particularly in the context of the first thousand days campaign. Um, look, I think so. Fitzroy was the first um, to get the alcohol restrictions. So you live in a town where we can't buy alcohol here. Um, so there's, there is a pub and there is the inn, so people can go and drink there, but it, there's a lot of restriction around that, like you get breatho going into the pub, um, you can only have mid drinks before this time, um, there's lots of things like that. So if you, if people here now want to go and get alcohol, you've got to drive 400 kilometres um, to go get it. Often um, you have to get a letter from the police too, so you're limited on how much you can buy. So I think those type of things um, on a legislation kind of high level are, are reducing the amount of um, women drinking while pregnant. And also now people are aware um, about it. Like I genuinely believe, um, and this is not just here in, um, in an indigenous population, but on, I started working in the FASD area back in 2000 in um, in Tasmania, you know, with middle class white people. Um, so this is a you know a national issue and so that there's just more um, awareness on it. We see it on the alcohol bottles now that you know, yeah. no pre no drinking while pregnant. And people are learning more about it, so then people are bringing it up and making people more accountable. So here, if I'm at the pub and I do see a pregnant woman, I might get punched in the face for it. I haven't yet, but I'll just say, hey, mama, why are you drinking? You're pregnant. You know, we've got a good, healthy, strong baby. I'll tell her husband. I'll tell her family. You need, you need to support this woman to stop her from drinking while pregnant because we want to have a good, healthy, strong baby. You know, I, I try to say it in a stern way, but not being judgmental as well. And other people will be shocked and they'll say, Tommy, you can't go up to someone and say that. I said, why not? of our responsibility to make sure that these children are brought into the world as healthy and as strong as possible. So I think that awareness, um, being up front, I mean, and I'll take it back to, you know, Tassie where I'm from, I'll say that to my own friends there too. Pre-pregnancy planning I think is a big thing, so I work, now I'm in the youth space, I'm working with the young people, um, we're doing a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff around sexual health and about pre-pregnancy planning, because someone might not know they're pregnant until eight, ten weeks. You know, if they're not having regular periods or things like that, or they're not aware, so they can be binge drinking that whole time. And that first trimester is really, really important for that development to growth of the baby, and it's affected. So someone might actually not know that they're drinking while pregnant because they don't know that they're pregnant. So I think just that education around pre-pregnancy planning and just raising awareness. Hope that answered your question, Maureen. Um, thanks, thanks, Donnie. That was that was um, that was really interesting and obviously and showing that um, these things, you know, they're not they're not just limited to one specific population group. For example, it's something that impacts all of us. Um, and that broader yeah. education and awareness. Um, We've got a couple of questions that I think could probably fit together. Um, we've got one from Laurel who I think um, if you could expand a little on exactly how you use Triple P um, in your work. And I, I think that might connect one with Maureen as well who was asking whether the Child and Family Centre um, works with pregnant women as well. Uh, sure yes, yeah, so... Um Child and Parent Centre is from yeah, pregnancy through to eight years of old, eight years of age is the funding area. Um, so we did do some pregnancy support stuff. We um, had women here um, that would come and have their midwife appointments. So the midwife would come and do a drop-in clinic once a week. 
Um, and then, yeah, we'd work with women while they were pregnant and then um, so that then there was that relationship straight through to when they had the baby, coming, having child health, um, coming to play groups and that long, um, you know, relationship and work with them. Um, in regards to the positive parenting, um, oh gosh, sorry, can you repeat that? What did you ask? Um, I think um, so I was uh, just wondering if you could expand a bit on how you use um, Triple P in your work. Yeah. So, oh gosh, just so when we when we got trained in it, there's about forty people in this town now that are trained as Triple P, or we call it Johnny Under You, facilitated. And so we do run your conventional workshops, like your two-day workshops or whatever, but the way we like to practice it best in this town is in everything we do. So from the moment, um, I'll give you an example, I come through the gate and we're seeing a child um, swinging on the gate as they love to do when they're getting dropped off at daycare, for example, the initial reaction before I did Johnny Under You was to say, no swinging on the gate, you know, using that no, don't, you know, no running and so switching into the walking, um, oh, but you like swinging, okay, let's go find you something to swing on. So then we're also role modeling it to the parents and then using it as a teaching moment saying, oh, you know, it's so easy to say, no running, no running, how about you try telling Kyle walking and then he'll look at you and go walking. And so when we're outside and the kids are climbing on something, um, when it's boring and the parents think, oh my God, my kid's going to fall, I can't believe they're climbing on these rocks. And I say, no, it's really important for our children and their gross motor skills to actually do that climbing and to do that exploring. Here, let's go over there and I know you're feeling really nervous that they're going to fall and crack their head open. But, um, and so taking the parent away from where they might be yelling, <laughs> get down, get down, Jack, stop climbing, stop climbing. So taking the parent and walking over and saying, see how Jack climbing on this is because, you know, he's got all this energy and he's really wanting to use his muscles. And so like teaching in the moment, I guess, that's how um, in particular, you know, I've really tried to use that approach. And let me tell you, um, since taking on these foster babies, I have had to go over time and I've realised um, myself how hard it is to implement it when you're tired and you're crabby, you've had the longest week at work um, and all that type of stuff, but to it constantly. And so that's been a really good experience for me to have these little ones to keep practising what I preach, you know, in the home. And now I am able to use that and go back to the, the families and say, oh, yeah, like, it's really hard to go to the supermarket, so why don't we pick, you know, when the kids are feeling this way, so let, let's pick a time that the kids are a bit more worn out or when they you know, got their best listening ears on instead of trying to take them at the end of the day when you've just finished work, you've just picked them up from daycare, you're tired, they're tired and crabby, it is going to be an absolute shit show. So can we get a bit organised maybe and we go before daycare when they're feeling a lot more, they've had their breakfast, they're happy, they're full, their listening ears are on and we can get our groceries then and pop them in the work fridge because we'll go straight to work. So that's kind of how I try to use the, the positive parenting. Thank you, Dominique. That was that was very um, helpful um, and detailed. Um, I think we're coming up to um, the end of the presentation now, so I'm afraid I don't think we'll be able to take any more questions. But thank you for those fantastic questions that did come through. I think it it um, definitely contributed to this discussion wonderfully um, and set up a lot of ideas to consider. Um, a recording of this webinar will soon be available for. Um, uh, on, on online but um, for RACI members. So if you're not a member, please consider signing up because uh, these parent engagement webinars alone would pay for a membership um, and there are many other fantastic reasons to join. If you're interested in the work of the Parent Engagement Network and would like to be a part of it, um, visit the RACI website for more information. We'll send you links in an email this afternoon. The network currently has over 700 members based all over Australia, people like yourselves who are passionate about the importance of parent engagement for improving the learning outcomes of children and young people. Um, we publish fantastic newsletters regularly. Dominique actually featured in one of our ones last year. Um, she's a bit of an Eracy superstar for us. Um, there's another one due next month, so keep an eye out for upcoming blog posts, other webinars. Um, we'll be planning another in a month um, with more on the horizon. Um, for other Eracy events, please visit our website. And once again, thank you so much to Dominique for 
another wonderful presentation that really um, hit home on a lot of those conceptually simple ideas that are quite difficult to implement. But Dominique, the way you're implementing them, I think, is a wonderful example to um, everyone working in this sector. So thank you very much. And um, thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.